On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don, and uh, today we're actually going to be talking about um, you know the overall process of uh, Genomenon and the work that uh, Mike Klein and the team at Genomenon have been doing. And so uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Don Davis, and I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help companies manage complexity, complexity and increase performance. So with that, Welcome, Mike. Welcome to the show. Hey, Don. It's a pleasure to uh, to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, just briefly, can you tell the listeners just a little bit about your background? How did you get started in tech and how did you become a ser- serial entrepreneur? Sure, sure. So my, my background is in um, is uh, engineering background. So I you know grew up as a computer engineer, electrical engineer. I uh, did about 10 years in uh, in the big corporations, uh, working for Motorola and Rockwell, and then decided to go off on my own about 30 years ago, start my first company. And so I've done, I've either led or founded uh, four different companies, all in the software or the IT space. So um, genomics and life science is a new area for me when I joined Genomenon about uh, six years ago, seven years ago. All right. And it, it, so with Rockwell, were you with a Rockwell automation systems or were you? Yeah. Were your primary yeah, yeah. I was with Rockwell Automation doing factory automation. And so, in fact, the first company I started was called Steeplechase Software. It was a factory automation software company. Um, so we, we grew that to be the market leader in its, in, its, uh, in its niche and sold that in 2000 to a multi-billion dollar French, French conglomerate. I went on to do a turnaround from a a software security company at the University of Michigan. And then um, the last 10 years before I joined Genomenon, or last eight years before I joined Genomenon, I was uh, doing a data center company. So early days of cloud computing, uh, five different data centers all across the Midwest, uh, a pretty uh, interesting business in itself. So can you tell us a little bit more about what what is Genomenon, what is it that they do? Sure. So uh, Genomenon is a uh, genome AI-driven genomics informa- uh, informatics or information company. So our whole mission, our whole focus is making genomic information actionable. And if you think about what's going on in the world of precision medicine, right, we're seeing that the price of, of, uh, of next generation sequencing drop pretty dramatically. In fact, I was giving another presentation, you know, where you show the line of Moore's Law and you show how much more aggressive the prices have dropped when you look at the price of, of sequencing. Um, you, you know, as a result, though, you're seeing an explosion of information, explosion of research, sm- explosion of publications. And the, one of the big challenges is actually turning all that data that we're creating in the world of next generation sequencing into something that's actionable. That's something that is actually what we consider to be knowledge versus just a whole bunch of data. And so our whole mission in this world is to make genomic information actionable, both to put information or that knowledge at the fingertips of clinicians in the process of diagnosing patients, as well as pharma researchers in developing precision medicine. Very good. Yeah, and and so what drove you into the life sciences world? What made you wanna go from, you know, kind of this world of automation and IT over into life sciences? So the, the one connecting point is the informatics piece, the IT, the software, and, and underlying what we do is we are a software and a data company. So that kind of you know, streams along the background that I've had throughout my entire career. But the genomics side came, um, quite frankly, when I was, uh, I was actually, uh, after I left my last company, I was a mentor at the University of Michigan, helping a dozen different startups. And I was approached by Mark Keel, uh, one of our founders, our co-founders at Genomenon, and he was looking to bring on an experienced CEO into the company. And quite frankly, I didn't know a lot about genomics or even biology, right? My whole area had been uh, on the IT side and software and software security. Um, but I fell in love with the mission and the whole idea of having an impact uh, on you know, cancer patients and helping get them to the right diagnosis, 
to help uh, diagnose and find the right treatment for babies born with rare diseases. And, you know, a lot of us, I think, many, many of us have been touched by uh, cancer somewhere in their lives. For me, it was my mother uh, who was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and passed away 30 years ago. And the whole promise of precision medicine to change the way that treatment is, you know, not just a one size fits all, but actually dialing in the right therapies and the right treatments based on the genomic profile of cancer, or in the case of rare diseases, the genomic profile of those rare diseases was a really compelling mission that went beyond you know, just software security or moving bits around in a data center, but actually had a, uh, you know, that life-saving purpose that so many people in life sciences find. Uh, I got addicted to, right? I just signed up for that mission and got really empowered by that mission. And I get up every day just thrilled about uh, the impact we're making in the world of genomics. Yeah, it's a bug that that uh, most of us can't shake after we find it. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, um, I mean, essentially, once you get that sort of, uh, you know, hey, I can have I can have a legitimate impact on people I know, um, you know, is is kind of you know something that I think you know all of us you know are just drawn to overall from the. Yeah the life sciences perspective. And yeah. um, you're right. I mean, uh, the closer and closer we seem to get with more and more genomic data, it seems like there's more still to be found, but at the same time, who knows, maybe, you know, maybe someday soon, right. We have something that's a significant answer for a significant, you know, amount of the, the patients that are out there, which would be phenomenal. Well, I, th I think that's, you know, coming from an engineering background where there was usually an answer, you could figure out an answer, there were systems and processes. You know, right. biology is fascinating, right? There's so much more that we haven't, so much that we haven't understood. There's so much more to learn. And I think that's another thing that's really compelling about life sciences is if you got the mentality of always learning, if you really want to, you know, continue, you, you, can, you can live in this world for, you know, the life sciences world for the next 50 years and you're always going to be discovering more and learning more there's and there's so much knowledge that just can't fit in one person's brain that is it's pretty incredible it really creates a team and a community effort to really move the ball forward yeah and so what are some of the lessons that you've learned in your career that have helped shape the future of genomenon um you know, so so first off, I think from uh, a startup perspective, right? So when we start, when I joined Genomenon, it was, you know, truly in a pure startup mode. Um, a lot of that was just product market fit. So of the three key lessons that I learned, the first one would be product market fit. Um, knowing that um, you got to get out there and you got to listen to customers. You, you, you think you know what your business plan is, but you know, you know you're wrong. And so how do you get out there and figure that out, right? How do you talk to customers, really understand the need? It's not about the technology, it's about the problem that you're solving and being able to, whether it's tweaking or pivoting, depending how drastic the change is, you know, continuing to fine tune the product to make sure it's fitting a real need in the marketplace. And so, you know, the first three companies that I did, at least the first two companies that I did, a lot of it was technology driven, looking for a market and um, at Genomenon, we really took a market perspective, making sure that the product, we we're very agile in developing the product and making sure we had good, good product market fit. Um, the second lesson I would say is timing. Timing is everything, right? If you're too early, great ideas can just die on the vine because either the technology isn't there, the market's not ready. If you're too late, you get killed because you can't get traction versus the competition. So really, you know, I think a lot of companies in the genomic space have poured a lot of, especially in the, the software side, have poured a lot of cash into the business, maybe a little bit too early. Um, yeah. And, you know, really being able to titrate, you know, how you're spending that cash with that product market fit and the traction, I think is a really important aspect of, of growing a business in this space. And then, um, you know, the third is the team. So I, I'm from Michigan, right? And, and University of Michigan, the team, the team, the team something they say a lot here uh, at the University of Michigan, but building a, you know, a phenomenal team. I don't think that this isn't a one person effort. This isn't like one person has it all in their head. We've just been able to, at Genomenon, and I think it's a lesson learned is just building a great team, making sure you got the right people and the right seats all tied to that mission that we talked about, right? And going in the same direction, 
signed up for the same set of core values in, in all building uh, against this very, you know, articulate goal that you know where you want to go. So critical uh, in the startup world and in the in building a company to the stage that we're at now and where we're going. Yeah, it's something that I feel like I spend a fair amount of time in working with companies that are trying to scale, talking about, you know, do people really understand your vision and mission? Can they, you know, if you woke them up at 1 a.m., could they tell you what the vision and mission is or would they lose it, you know, would they lose it in the midst of the sleepiness? Um, you know, and so many times, you know, I find that founders, you know, haven't spent that time. They they just haven't spent the time to to communicate it. And then they wonder why, you know, as they've added, you know, they move from the 10 to 20 people or they're trying to go from 20 to, I mean, sometimes it's 250 is the story I get. And I'm like, yeah, well, there's no reason, no, no real uh, mystery here as to why people are lost. I mean, I don't understand your vision and mission uh, as an outsider. And I can tell you that your team probably doesn't either. So let's start yeah. there. And, and, you know, culture is that other part, right? So once you've got a really yeah. clear mission and your purpose and everybody's aligned, aligned along those lines, making sure that your core values are in place, that you define the culture. So I, I really screwed up in my first company. We tripled the size of the company in six months. And I was like, yeah, we're a, start, we're a startup. We don't need no stinking culture, right? That's all big right. companies. Oh, wrong, right? That took me two <laughs> years to unwind those mistakes that we made in six, six months you know, yeah. just really getting down. And so at, at Genomenon, we're really careful and focused on, you know, building a great culture and really being able to articulate the culture um, to, you know, candidates that are considering coming in. Hey, this is what we're all about, right? We're an always learning team. We're, you know, we're about true grit, right? We're humble, humble confidence is another one of our core values. Just making sure that the right people understand the fit and the wrong people understand where they don't fit in and we can continue mm -hmm. in that culture because it's man it's so hard when you're doubling the size of a company every year it's so easy to screw things up from a culture perspective yeah yeah and i mean it did it, it like to your point right i mean once you've done it it's so hard to unwind i mean it is it is a it can become a near impossibility especially if you get that really sort of negative culture in place, it's, I mean, I, it, it could take, you know, man years to actually undo. Um, and I, I don't think enough people give that credit either. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I think it's a really important aspect. And as you know, we just, we just raised a, a, a series B financing, which means we're going to be fueling a lot of growth. And that's one area that I'm just dialed in on is making sure that we don't give up on the culture as we grow the company. Yeah, and so I mean, as you kind of see the the overall runway for Genomenon, how do you see Genomenon having a lasting impact in the world? Then, so so Don, you know, our our mission over the next three years is to curate the entire genome. If you think about that bottleneck that we see in the genomic space, it's all about uh, we're creating a ton of data, but we don't know how to you know getting knowledge from that data is a very time consuming, expensive process. So Think about if you do a whole genome sequencing, right, and the thousands of variants that need to be researched. And so you quickly filter those down, but you're still spending, sending PhDs or master's level um, scientists that are spending a lot of time calling through the literature, trying to find the evidence, trying to, to make a diagnosis based on all the scientific peer reviewed evidence that's out there. Our view of the world and, you know, our genomic search engine takes people to the literature, but pharma companies came back to us and said, can you start curating diseases? So tell us every variant and every gene and the pathogenicity of those genes by like ACMG or AMP guidelines. And now we've moved to the next version of that vision, which is curating the entire genome. Every gene, every variant for every disease curated and at the fingertips of the clinicians, the fingertips of scientists to make those decisions that much faster. So now I'm not spending my time researching the literature. I've got all that information in my fingertips to very quickly diagnose uh, diagnose patients. And you think about the game changer that having a fully curated genome will mean to, to our industry, to, to the NGS market. Think about newborn screening and where we're going in, you know, what is it, uh, 120 million new babies born around the world. And if with a single heel prick, we can diagnose the five to 7% of those that have a rare disease and preemptively start treating them, the type of impact that we can have. 
or think about cancer screening. If you can understand every variant that's circulating in your bloodstream and be able to, to, to very quickly diagnose and make a diagnosis around that, it's, it's, it's life-changing you know, in, a, in the way and the type of impact that we can have as we accomplish that mission. Yeah, it's the way that I mean the the guys that are studying epigenetics right uh, right now and looking at the entire um, you know biome human you know biome uh, as well just really you know kind of overall opens up this idea that you know there's there's a lot to us in terms of biology that could impact uh, you know cancer and the future of cancer and um, you know I I for sure you know would love to know you know if if somebody could tell me, you know, hey, look, change your diet today and, you know, it'll reduce these amounts in your body, that would be phenomenal. Um, but at the same time, there's so much that we don't know. It's like, you know, hey, uh, d don't drink coffee and uh, don't drink red wine. And then tomorrow, drink coffee and drink red wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I, you diet on, yeah. diet off. I don't know. So it's yeah. uh, it. it, it, it is something that I definitely look forward to having a lot more information about the things that are happening. And, and I definitely think that, you know, you're, you're right in terms of the bioinformatics that in the, the study that goes into all of this stuff and just the immense, immense amounts of data that it requires to be able to, to actually bring something to fruition is, is pretty challenging. Uh, and the companies that have done it, right. I mean, there are companies that are, you know, for sure, developing diagnostics in this in, in these areas, but at the same time, having more and more information will be helpful. Yeah, and I think you know what what we're seeing happen in the next generation sequencing marketplace is very similar to what we've seen. You know, I certainly saw this in factory automation. You could see this in even Netflix, for example, uh, at the consumer level, where they spent years and years and years building out the platform. And today we don't talk about the Netflix platform at all, right? What does everybody talk about? Content. It's content, content, content. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I think we're going to see that same transition happen as we've got, you know, very solid platforms in place. There's a lot of players playing in the reagent space. We're creating a ton of data, but making sense of that data, that knowledge base, I think is really where this industry is, is turning to and will evolve where, you know, knowledge will be king, uh, content will be king as we look at this, uh, this space over the next uh, three to five years. Yeah, I mean, we even saw that in terms of COVID. I mean, a lot of a lot of the drug companies, if you look inside of them today, they went and bought, you know, data catalog software and things like that so they could curate the information that they have. It's a similar, similar sort of challenge. They just, you know, they've created, you know, lots and lots of amounts of data that, uh, that they want to be able to get their hands on pretty quickly as well. And, uh, I, you know, uh, one of the things that that I know I've seen is that you know they've they've figured out a way to get you know better marking better ways to to mark their data and make sure that they can you know tag and get back to the information that they have on hand so that when the next you know pandemic comes they can react a heck of a lot faster as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in terms of uh, your entrepreneurial experience, I want to dive into that a little bit. So is there any advice that you would give somebody that was a, uh, just a new entrepreneur in the space? What what would you sort of give them in ter terms of guiding advice? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, yes. So there's a couple of things I would I would tell um, entrepreneur, brand new entrepreneurs is, number one, your business plan is wrong. So just accept that fact, right? And And don't be bothered by it you need to have a thesis you need to have a theory of where you're going but you need to be agile and be able to re react you know think about skiing the moguls blindfolded right you got to be able to react to what's coming at you and be able to keep your knees bent and figure that out as you're as you're going uh down down the hill and you know that product market fit was a great example of what i was talking about is making sure that you really understand what your customers want that you're listening to them and that you're crafting your business plan around the feedback that you're getting. You got to start somewhere. You got to have a plan. And I think if you accept from the fact, you know, from the very beginning that your plan is wrong, uh, it makes it a lot easier to, to adapt it rather than just say, ah, oh, I got this all figured out, you know, hundred percent. I'm right. I know exactly where this is going to go. Mm, not that easy. Not that easy. If you could rewind the clock, right? So you, you know, 
overall and in, in terms of thinking about this space within life sciences, is there any um, sort of advice that you would give somebody that that maybe currently outside of the life sciences industry considering considering something in the life sciences um, in terms of you know considering a career here? Um, yeah, you know, if I could rewind the clock, I think I would have gotten into life sciences a lot a lot sooner. Um, and I think that comes back down to that, that purpose, that, uh, that mission that you and I talked about earlier is, you know, just the ability to have an impact, you know, at a, just a whole nother level that you can have in, for example, software security or, you know, running data centers, all of which we need, right? We need people to do that. Um, but the impact that you can have and the life, the life changing impact you can have is really uh, an exciting place to get to be. And I think the other side is that um, if if you're the type of person that is always learning and, and you're always you know, you want to absorb more, you're not going to run out of things to learn in the life sciences <laughs> space. Right? Right. There, there's always something new, right? It's not it's not like okay, I got this figured out. I just it's, it's another it's another data center. It's another computer. It's another network. There's just a you know there's just so much evolving here that I think it's a really exciting space um, to be in and. We're, you know, we're, even in genomics, we're still in the very early innings. There's so much yeah. innovation and discovery and invention that's going to happen here over the next 30 years that um, you're not going to run out of headroom on your career if you're, if you're jumping into the genomics space. I, I mean, the other thing that I that I oftentimes tell people as well is that if you like working around brilliant people, I mean, there are a lot of them in this space. I mean, I, I don't include myself in that at all in that uh, that realm. I, I, I definitely look at some of the stuff that we've done where, you know, they'll take a, you know, the, the COVID vaccines, a good example, you know, they'll take you know, one virus that's not, you know, contagious to humans, essentially tell it, hey, look, go hunt this and then go kill it. <laughs> and uh, that instruction being in your body now all of a sudden is is something that your body can interpret and say, oh, OK, so this is something that I should fight off. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it's just amazing to me that uh, people are, you know, in this space are just so brilliant as well. You know, that's you know, one of our core values at Genoma is humble confidence. And I think it's because mm. of that, because there are just, you know, it, it's important to, to know what you know, be confident about what you know. But it's also important to be to know what you don't know, because there are so many people uh, in the life sciences space that know so much. And collectively, you can put together, you know, much better solutions and come up with and solve much bigger problems uh, as a community and as a team than you can do you know, as an individual or a small group of people. So I think you're, you're spot on with that, Don. Fantastic. And in terms of your career, what has been your proudest moment? You know, I would say there's um, there's uh, there's probably two things that make me, you know, that, that I would say are really kind of stand out. One is just watching the team we put together at Genomino accomplish in five short years uh, what we've been able to, to accomplish and deliver. So, you know, starting off five years ago, um, when we introduced the first genomic search engine, and, and quite literally had a lot of people saying, you know, talk to the hand. That's, you know, they, they, can't, they couldn't be, you can't do that. AI can't do that. You can't do that. It's impossible. And we got thrown out of more accounts and more, more places than I can even tell you, right? And going from there to having the world's leading genomic search engine um, and being used across, you know, over 2,000 labs all around the world, is a uh, is quite quite you know fulfilling to watch the team be able to put that together and to be able to pull that off, and then redialing in with the work we've done with pharma and setting our sights on the next goal of curating the the um, the entire human genome. To me, I have every confidence in the world that this is the team uh, that can do that. So to me, that's that's really rewarding to watch a team of really brilliant people come together to accomplish those goals. The other comes back to, you know, it comes back to that mission and, and kind of one of those things that gets me up in the morning. So um, very specifically, when we were working with Rady Children's Hospital, and this was mm, three, four years ago, they were in the pilot stage of trying to use and they were using Mastermind um, to in, in their clinical diagnosis. And they had a, a baby three days old that was having a dozen life threatening seizures uh, every day. Uh, ran them through and did the rapid whole genome sequencing to see if they could find out what the cause, uh, the cause uh, was. 
They looked in, you know, existing manually curated databases. They found nothing. They looked in Google and Google Scholar and found nothing. And it wasn't until they went into Mastermind that they were able to connect the pa one of those patient, the baby's variants, with a single scientific paper. And that scientific paper suggested a nutritional defect when they supplemented the baby's diet, the seizure stopped. And, you know, this baby, his name is Fritz. They've actually been uh, out, uh, you know, talking about this, this case now. And it's that type of impact of finding a single paper and connecting that paper with the variant for the clinician, right? We weren't doing all the heavy lifting. We were just in the background making sure that that clinician could find that paper to make that diagnosis. That's rewarding. That is really rewarding. And we're seeing that over and over again with a number of our clients and a number of our, our users that are able to find that needle in a haystack. And in the world of rare diseases, it is looking for needles in a haystack. <laughs> and so to have the team that's been able to organize every needle in every haystack and put that at the fingertips uh, of our users to be able to have that kind of impact is very rewarding. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, it, it, the story does sound absolutely amazing um, overall, and and thankfully, um, you know, you were you were there for Fritz uh, for sure. <laughs> it's it's the type of thing that gets it gets me up every morning, right? Excited to do what we're doing, and hopefully, everybody on the Genomenon team is just as excited to get up every morning, put their feet on the ground, and hit the ground running to to do the things that we do. And, and I'm sure that's true across all of life sciences. Or much of life sciences that kind of impact. Yeah. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've had? You know, I, I think it's interesting because um, in the life sciences market, the adoption rate, you know, you're selling to scientists, uh, you're selling to uh, clinicians, and, and by definition, scientists are skeptical. So the, um, the uh, adoption curve is much slower than what I've seen in other markets. Um, you know, that talk to the hand thing is like, you know, bullshit, it can't be done, prove it to me. Um, that is, that I think is, is uh, an interesting challenge in the life science market that is uh, a slower adoption rate than what I've seen in other places. And when you get and understand who your users are, right? And you understand that scientific uh, um, bias that they have and, and how they, they really come at it from that perspective, it kind of explains that. So I think that, in the early days was a uh, was a significant challenge for us. And I think as we even as we talk about curating the genome, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that are saying, bullshit, you know, talk to the hand. It's not going to happen. You can't do it. And we're going to just keep chipping away at it and proving our way uh, over the next three years, five years that we can actually do that. And that's how it happens. I mean, it's uh, to me, that's that's the way that all of this stuff, you know, seems to happen is that, you know, somebody decides that regardless of how, no matter how many naysayers there might be, they're going to, you know, just keep chipping away at it day after day until eventually, you know, they're closer or maybe even there. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly so there are right. three questions that I like to ask every guest. Mike, what inspires you? You know, what, ins what inspires me is the work that we're doing, the mission that we're on, the ability quite literally to arm clinicians and researchers with the tools and the information they need to make patients' lives better. Um, that, that, like I said, that gets me up every morning. And, and the other thing that inspires me, inspires me is, is the team and watching this team of, you know, I'm getting, getting you know, I'm, I'm an old entrepreneur now, right? And so I'm watching the next, uh, the next generation come in and you, know, you look at the founders of Genomenon and you know, just the brilliance of, of not just the founders, but the rest of the team that we put in place and the, you know, brilliant ideas that they're bringing in, in, the, in the, uh, there and, uh, and the way that they're actually making all this happen. Uh, that's inspiring to watch, uh, to watch that team come together to really accomplish the things that, that, that they're accomplishing. Very good. And what concerns you? Oh. Uh, what concerns me? Um, Good, good question. I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're playing in a world where the, um, there's a lot of moving pieces, right? If you think about not just the biology of things, but this market, we're still in a relatively new market. There's a lot of moves that um, 
competitors are making, that other players are making. And, you know, we, we, we're skating to where the puck is going, but the puck may not be there, right? And so <laughs> that's what, what concerns me is, you know, paying attention to where the puck is going and making sure we're making the course adjustments because just, we, just because we think we know the world is going to be in five years doesn't mean it's going to be there. It's not a, a straight line trajectory by any means. Yeah, that, I, it's funny because one of the one of the diagrams I oftentimes uh, draw for people is, you know, you have this sort of um, vertical line that goes on up on the innovation side. And then you have another vertical or horizontal line that comes out on the business process side that need to kind of grow to gr grow together. Um, and if they don't have that balance, then you oftentimes wind up in kind of a, an odd spot you know, from maybe business culture or scalability and and so on. But the one thing I also acknowledge is that the, the line for your company's execution isn't straight. It's very sort of up and down. And I mean, we have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the world is still going to continue to turn. And, you know, there's all these outside influences that I certainly can't, you know, tell you about today. I don't have a crystal ball, but um, but yeah, that for sure can be a challenge, but at the same time, that's why you reevaluate strategy and, and, uh, you know, you continue to evolve, right? Yeah. And I think it's probably part of the fun too, right? If you, if you enjoy the strategy part of things, you know, it, just the, the world is unknown. It's going to come at you and you need to be able to have a, a team that can react to that and be able to make good decisions and pivot around whatever information is coming, coming at you. Very good. Last question. What excites you? Um, boy, I hate to, to sound like I'm repeating myself, but you know, what is excites me, I think the, the genomics market and, you know, the way that the science is evolving, the way that, um, the knowledge is evolving to really have an impact on, on, uh, on, um, on lives, uh, across the board. I think that, like I said, we're in the very early innings of the genomics, uh, and next generation sequencing and the way that precision medicine is going to have an impact. Uh, across the board on, um, you know, think about what the world is going to look like 10 years from now, from mm. newborn screening to going in for your annual exam and getting your cancer screening through a blood test, right? Our, our world uh, is going to be very different, even at a very personal level, uh, when we think about um, screening for cancer. So I, I think that's a very exciting prospect uh, of, of where this whole entire uh, genomics market and genomics effort is, is going. So with that, Mike Klein, I wanted to thank you so much for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely look forward to continuing to watch the work at Genomenon and the work that you guys are doing. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Don. I really enjoyed the, uh, the conversation. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again.